Hello, Lincoln Lighthouse Church. Guest and friends, today we are going to be talking about the gifts of the Spirit. This is a continue, um, continuation of our Wednesday night Bible study. And tonight, the uh, 11th of May of 2022, we are not going to be gathering together at our home as we usually do for our Bible study uh, due to sickness in our family. And so we want to make sure that nobody else gets what Lucas has. And so we are going to be live streaming it to Facebook and also to our YouTube page. And hopefully you can get the information there and join along with us as we study the scripture regarding the gifts of the spirit. So in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, the uh, author of the book, Paul, is writing to the church in Corinth. And he's saying, now, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to misunderstand or be uninformed about spiritual gifts. There are different kinds of gifts, but they are all from the same spirit. There are different ways to serve or to minister, uh, different ministries, but the same Lord to serve. And there are different ways that God works through people, kinds of actions and activities but the same God works in all of us in everything we do. Something from the Spirit can be seen in the manifestation or the disclosure of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. I'm so thankful and I believe that the power of God is Spirit is still working in each and every one of us every day, giving us the ability to lift others up, and to encourage each person for the common good. Remember last week we talked about the gifts of the Spirit, that they are many, that they come from God, that they're meant for the service of God, they're meant for all aspects of our life, and they are individually given to every born-again believer. Remember last week we also talked about before operating in the gifts of the Spirit, we should embrace the fruit of the spirit or the spiritual things that are growing in your life. We talked about the fruit is love, joy. Can you quote them? Peace, long suffering, goodness, gentleness, meekness, faith, temperance. And so those fruits of the spirit should be working in our lives when we are operating in the gifts of the spirit. In other words, our spiritual character should always precede performance. It should always be the thing that is guiding and making sure that the things that we are doing with the gifts of the Spirit are done in the right way for the right reason. The structure of the gifts of the Spirit or how they are framed or what surrounds them is what I want to talk about today. And so we all know, I think we all agree that God is the giver of the gifts of the Spirit, and he assigns men and women as the guardians of those gifts. Have you ever been given something extremely important, something extremely valuable, and that you are the guardian of that gift? So let's make sure that we have the fruit of the Spirit operating in our lives so that we will be proper guardians of what the Lord has given us. So why do we have these gifts? Why do we need them or want them in our lives? And Paul wrote to the book or to the church in Ephesus in the book of Ephesians, the second chapter, and he says, You are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophet with Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined, it's bound or welded together harmoniously, and it continues to rise or to grow and increase into a holy temple of the Lord, a sanctuary dedicated, consecrated, and sacred to the presence of the Lord. In him and in fellowship with one another, you yourselves also are being built up into this structure with the rest to form a fixed abode or a dwelling place of God by and through his spirit. Never take for granted, please, never take for granted the awesome privilege that we have 
as human beings to house God's precious gifts. Remember in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul asked the questions, do you not know that your body is the temple, the very sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who lives within you? You, you have received as a gift from God. You are not your own. You are bought with a price and purchased with the preciousness and was paid for by his own blood. Then honor God and bring glory to him in your bodies. I want to go back just to the first one we talked about in Ephesians about him being the chief cornerstone and that everything goes or grows from him. If you go downtown to some older buildings, maybe at the courthouse or uh, the state capitol, you might see a, a stone that they set on a day and said, this is the cornerstone. This is the chief stone that we set on this day for this building. That stone sets a lot of things. It knows exactly where the building is going to grow from. It says, okay, this is the corner and everything else in this building is going to radiate out and it is going to radiate up from this chief cornerstone. So in our lives, God should be that chief cornerstone. He should be the thing that everything else radiates out from and upward to. So our relationships with each other as they radiate out should be based on the structure that God has given us. Our gifts back to him the structure going up, if you will, is what should be given to God by his word and by the principles that we have in the Bible. He's given us these gifts. He's given us this enhancement to help us in our life to build up this structure, to make sure that it is built the proper way and for the right reasons. So make sure that whatever you do in these gifts that God has given us, because he has given these gifts to us. In Ephesians 4, by Paul says, however, he, God, has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. Aren't you so happy that you serve a generous Christ? That is why the scripture says, so he, he ascended to the heights and he led a crowd of captive and he gave gifts to his people. I'm so thankful for those gifts that he gives to every one of us. So we're going to talk about five gifts that every structure that is built of God or every church, if you will, needs. So these are the five things that God has given. And a lot of people call it the five-fold ministry or the five different ways or five different offices that we use to feed, to edify, to build up, and to help the church. So the first one that we're going to talk about is an apostle. Every church, every church organization or group needs an apostle. So in Ephesians 4 is where Paul kind of tells about this is what these gifts are, these, these five uh, gifts that are for the structure, for the needs of the church. And so you might ask, well, what's an apostle? That's not a word that we hear a lot of. In 2022, we don't hear a lot of about apostle this guy or apostle this woman going somewhere and doing something. But Vine's dictionary says the word apostle means one sent forth or a messenger. And Jesus gave the church apostles. And apostles are basically called by to preach the gospel or to share the gospels in places where. It has never been preached or received before, where it's never been heard before. So you can say, well, apostle, that's a first generation or church generation thing. But I believe that we still have apostles today among us. And I'm not going to name names because I don't think that's what we really need to concentrate on today. But what I really want to concentrate on is you can be an apostle. You can be someone that is sent forth as a messenger of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can be the one. I can be the one that takes the gospel to places where it has not been heard. It maybe hasn't been received. 
or it hasn't been taught in a specific area. Let's talk about our church community or our communities that we live in. Let's talk about the neighborhoods that we live in, our families, our workplaces that we are in. Maybe we don't have the uh, ability to go to some continent where um, the gospel has never been preached, where people have never heard the name Jesus, but there are places that we can go to even today that we can spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can be the one that goes to a place, whether it's in your lunchroom at your factory or in your office, and you can say, have you ever heard of Jesus? Have you ever heard of salvation? Have you ever had the power of the Holy Ghost working inside of you? You and I have the ability and the opportunity to be an apostle to our world today. If you want to read in the book of Acts, the 14th chapter, it talks about Paul and Barnabas and how what they reacted because people were responding to the things that were happening. And so um, they, they responded to what they were calling it. People were being called apostles because they were bringing the news of the gospel. They were doing signs and wonders, and people were responding to that. In Philippians 2 and 25, Paul told the church, I thought it necessary to send Aphrodias back to you. He has been my brother and companion in labor and my fellow soldier, as well as having come as your special messenger or your apostle and minister to my need. So here is this, this man that is going. He is the special, special messenger or the apostle that was sent to these people. And so I want God to be able to use me to do his work, to spread his gospel wherever it may need to be spread or where he wants it to be spread. So allow God to direct you, allow God to use you. And just never forget, though, that there can be true apostles like we talked about, but also there can be false, uh, false apostles. Remember that Paul in 2 Corinthians 11 talked about these false apostles that were coming into the church and they were they were they were causing all kinds of problems and to make sure that they understood the gospel and the doctrine that had been given to the church at the at the origin and to make sure that you follow that gospel no matter what anybody else may say we need to make sure that we follow the teachings of the bible instead of just anything that anybody else says. The second thing that we want to take a look at is the office or the gift of prophets. Prophets. That same thing in Ephesians 4 and 11, he says where he's talking about prophets were a gift to the church. A prophet can be described or defined as one who moves by the spirit of god and is his spokesman he declares to men what he has received by inspiration especially concerning future events in particular such as they relate to the cause of the kingdom of god and to human salvation they are moved by the holy spirit to have to speak having power to instruct to comfort to encourage, to rebuke, to convict, to stimulate those people that are hearing what they have to say. Prophets many times have the ability to foretell things that are going to happen or to prophesy about something that someone else is going to do, whether good or bad. So there are prophets that are happening in the world, but I want to make sure that we know that even though it might be something that somebody is able to predict the future or they are able to do uh, say things or uh, prophesy about the things that might be happening around us and how it relates to the Bible, we have to make sure that every time that a prophecy is given or every time a word is spoken,
that it is bound by the written word of God. And when you do that, you are going to make sure that you are not led astray or led down a, a rabbit hole, as we call it today, that you are going to believe something that is not true. In 2 Peter 1, 16 through 21, Peter said, For we are not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes when he received honor and glory from God the Father. The voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him in the holy mountain. Because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. You must pay close attention to what they wrote, for their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and Christ the morning star shines in your hearts. Above all, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or from human initiative. No, those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit as they spoke from God. So make sure that the prophecies that you might be hearing, make sure that they align with and are in tune with the Bible and the word of God as we know it. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15 through 20, because of false prophets who came disguised as harmless sheep, but are serious, are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Remember when we started this, we talked about the fruit of the Spirit should be working in our lives before the gifts can really function as they should. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down, thrown into the fire, Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, you can identify people by their actions. So that's why I wanted to cover that at the beginning of this lesson today is those fruits of the spirit should be the thing that is operating in our lives and the reason that we are prophesying. The reason that we are uh, doing the things that we need to do for the Lord is because we want to have the best motive and the best possible outcome for the people that we are talking to, not for our glory or not for our financial gain. The third thing that I want to talk about today is what the structure or the church needs is evangelists. They are gifts of, to the church. In Ephesians 4 and 11 is where we refer to that a lot, is where Paul laid all of this out. And so the dictionary defines an evangelist as a messenger of good or one who preaches the gospel. So a lot of times we think about an evangelist as someone that just goes around and, and holds different sermons or different meetings, preaches different evangelistic or you know, exciting messages of God into our, um, into our communities and into our churches. But I wanna let you know that you can be an evangelist because you are a messenger for the good or one who preaches the gospel. So the marks of an evangelist are this. They'll be anointed to preach the gospel. They will be used in various gifts of the spirit. They are an effective soul winner or somebody that converts someone to the gospel. And they will not be self-promoted. They will not be walking around saying, oh, I'm a mighty evangelist and I do all of this stuff. See how cool I am and how wonderful I am. But they're going to be somebody that's not self-promoting. All they are wanting to do is convert people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're going to be able to do that very effectively. In Acts 21, Philip was called an evangelist. Paul said that 
or I'm sorry, in Acts, they said, the next day we went on to Caesarea and stayed at the home of Philip the evangelist, one of the seven men who had been chosen to distribute food. He had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. So it's pretty interesting that he was one of the seven men who had been chosen to distribute food. But here, Philip didn't just say, well, that's all I do. All I do is hand out, you know, I uh, hand out chicken nuggets and French fries. I, I just give out food and that's that's all I do. But no, there was something inside the heart of Philip that says, I don't want to just hand out food, but I'm going to be an evangelist. I am going to go out and, and bring people to the Lord. I'm going to be a soul winner. I'm going to be one that goes out and, and uses whatever gifts God has given me to be able to do those work that the kingdom of God needs us to do in acts the eighth chapter philip operated as an evangelist he went to the city of samaria and told the people there about the messiah in verse six it says the crowds listened intently to philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs that he did many evil spirits were cast out screaming as they left their victims and many who had been paralyzed or lame were healed so there was great joy in that city. A man named Simon had been a sorcerer there for many years, amazing the people of Samaria and claiming to be someone great. Everyone from the least to the greatest often spoke as spoke of him as the great one, the power of God. They, they listened closely to him because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic. But now the people believe Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. And as a result, many men and women were baptized. And then Simon himself believed and was baptized and began following Philip wherever he went. And he was amazed by the signs and the great miracles Philip performed. So this is an amazing opportunity that we as born again believers have to be able to convert have the ability to affect, have the ability to work miracles in the places that we go to. Every one of us have the ability and the opportunity to be an evangelist. The fourth thing that I want to talk about tonight is pastors. Pastors. So in, again, in Ephesians 4 and 11 is where Paul talks about the gifts and pastors are included in that, what we call the fivefold or the five offices of ministry and a pastor is designed or described defined as a shepherd one who tends herds or flocks and is not merely as one who feeds them so a pastor should be someone more than gets up in the pulpit on sundays at 10 o'clock and preaches a nice sermon and feeds somebody spiritually although that is part of it but one is one who the pastor is one who shepherds the people one who takes care of them, tends to the herd or the flocks, if you will. That is a term that we interchange a lot with um, a shepherd and a pastor, but I don't want to call people flocks or herds, but that, that's how it should be. A pastor should be somebody that has a heart to help and a heart to lift up, a heart to tend to the people and to feed them spiritually in their lives. Other Biblical names for a pastor are overseer, an elder, an under shepherd, or a bishop. And so there are actually 16 qualifications that are outlined in 1 Timothy 3 1 through 7 when Paul is talking about, he's telling Timothy, hey, you, you want uh, the office of a bishop or a pastor, this is what you need to look at. So this is the, the, uh, the job description, if you will, in modern day terminology be about what a pastor should be doing, what it's all about. So in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, Paul said, this is a true saying, if a man desires the office of a bishop or a pastor, he desireth a good work. A bishop or a pastor must be blameless or have a good reputation. It doesn't say he has to be perfect, but he has to have a good reputation. 
if there's anybody in the church that should have the gifts of the spirit as well as the fruit of the spirit working in their lives it should be the bishop or the pastor of the church should be the husband of one wife vigilant or temperate sober self-controlled have good behavior given to hospitality which means he doesn't mind taking care of people the pastor shouldn't be someone that is a lord or a king over the church and everybody comes and serves and ministers to him but the bishop the pastor should be one that is given to hospitality knows how to take care of people knows how to serve others someone that is apt to teach not given to wine not a striker not greedy a filter filthy lucre or not money not but he has to be patient not a brawler this is somebody that always wants to throw down anytime there's an issue that shouldn't be the the way that we handle things in the church and not covetous one that rule well his own house having his children in subjection with all gravity so how you run your house should be an indication of how you are going to run or deal with people in the church for if a man in verse five know not how to rule his own house how shall he take care of the church of god verse six says not a novice lest being lifted up with pride he falls into the condemnation of the devil moreover he must have a good report of them which are without lest he fall into reproach and a snare of the devil so this office of a pastor, an overseer, the, the bishop of the church is a very important part because there are so many things that you take care of as a pastor and leader of the church. So there, there's a lot of things, 16 qualifications there that make sure that us as pastors, that we are doing it for the right reason and we are doing with pureness of motive. In Jeremiah, 3 and 15 God said I will give you pastors according to mine heart which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding that is why we have Bible study on Wednesdays and that's why we come together as a church and we preach and we have people minister to us and teach us things is because we want to have knowledge and understanding I want to know more about what the Bible says how I should live my life I want to know more about what God requires of me and expects from me. I want to know all the benefits and all the blessings that I have access to as a person that is a part of the kingdom of God. This is what we have the uh, fivefold ministry to do. The last thing that we I want to talk about today, the number five is teachers. Teachers, they are a gift of God to the church. According to the Greek lexicon, teachers are those who in the religious assembly of the Christians undertook the work of teaching with special assistance of the Holy Ghost. I really believe that teachers in the church, people that spend time understanding the word of God and are able to give that information over to people are a precious commodity in the church. They undertook the work of teaching. Teaching is work. You know, it's sometimes we want to look at the, the glitz and the glamour of the lights and 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 the, the the pastor up there or the evangelist up there on the platform preaching the word of God. But sometimes the teaching that maybe you do over a chair uh, over the you're sitting down in some chairs at, at a table and and opening the Bible and, and being able to talk with somebody and having the special assistance of the Holy Spirit to allow you to teach somebody something that is going to change their life, for them to be able to understand, for them to be able to receive what the, the Bible is trying to give them, that is a special place, I believe, in the kingdom of God. In Romans 4, I'm sorry, Romans 12 and 7, the apostle states, your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. Don't just think, well, I'm just teaching a Sunday school, or I'm just teaching a new converts class, or 
you know, I'm just filling in here doing this thing. But if you're going to teach, teach well. Make sure that you spend time understanding for yourself. Spend time in prayer and allow God to speak to you to be able to give you the words and the understanding to make sure that others know what they need to do to be saved. In 1 Timothy 4 and 13, Paul let his son in the, in the Lord know how to be an effective teacher. And it says in, there, it says, until I come, continue to read the scripture to the people, attend, devote yourself to public reading of the scriptures, strengthen, that means to encourage or exhort them and teach them, use, do not neglect the gift from the spirit, the spiritual gift you have that is in you, which was given to you through the prop, through prophecy, when the group of elders laid their hands on you. Verse 15 says, continue, take care, be diligent to do those things, give your life to doing them so your progress may be seen by everyone. Be careful, conscientious in your life and in your teaching. If you continue to live and teach rightly, preserve in these or persevere in these things, you will save both yourself and those that listen to you. This is so important, and I believe that it's going to be even greater as we get farther into the end times in which we are living, for those to be able to sit down with somebody, and because people are coming, they're saying, I feel something different, and I feel that things have changed, that there's something different in the world, that we are in a different place, where that something is happening, and what is it? And for us to be able to be ready to say, this is what I believe is happening. This is what the scripture is prophesying. This is what the, the prophets of old, as well as even today, are saying that this is the coming of the Lord is getting very close and be able to share that with somebody and teach them you are going to be able to save their souls because they are listening to you. So in Ephesians 4 and 12, it states that we need the fivefold ministry that Christ has given those gifts to prepare, to equip God's holy people for the work of serving to make the body of Christ stronger. This work must continue until we are all joined together in the same faith and in the same knowledge of the Son of God. We must continue as a mature person, a perfect man or woman in Christ, to be growing until we become like him and have his perfection, the measure of the statue of Christ's fullness living inside of us. When, when people see me, I don't want them to necessarily see Dean Diacentis, but I want them to be able to see that there is something different about Dean. There is something, there is something that he has that interests me. It, it's something that is drawing my spirit to him, and I want to have what he has. And for there to be that ability for me to be able to teach them the ways of God. I believe that God has a great work for each and every one of us to do in this last day. I believe that the church's finest hours are ahead of us. It's not behind us. And I believe that there is a growing group of people in our world today that are looking for truth. They are looking for righteousness. They are looking for God's power to work in their life, and I want to be a part of what God is doing in this last day. I want to prepare my spirit. I want to have the fruit of the spirit living inside of me that I can say, I am going to be able to witness. I'm going to be able to be the evangelist. I have the ability to be the apostle or whatever God has given me the gift to be in the name of Jesus. I pray God blesses you. I pray that this encourages you and excites you to do more for him in the kingdom of God. God bless every one of you. I look forward to seeing you on Sunday at 2.30 at 585 D Street in Lincoln for our Lincoln Lighthouse Church service. If you don't have a church home and you are looking for a place to come and be a part of a spirit-filled church, we welcome you. God bless you. Have a great day in Jesus.